Hello all, Dr. Jeanette Nicewinner here with an art appreciation lecture on Italian Baroque art. You might be wondering where we get the term Baroque from, and I'm here to tell you we have no idea. So um, the best guess that scholars have is that the term Baroque comes from a Portuguese term Barocco, meaning an irregular pearl. And what we're going to see with the Baroque, why they um, think this is the case, is because Baroque is very irregular um, in terms that it is not following the tenets of humanism and not following the um, classical model of the Renaissance. So we're going away from that model. I want to start by talking about the Protestant Reformation because the Italian Baroque and the Northern Baroque are both reactions to this Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation actually starts at the end of our last lecture. So it starts in 1517 with Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral on October 31st, 1517. And one of the things that Martin Luther, um, who is a monk, is objecting to is this idea of purchasing indulgences or giving money to the church in order to lessen your time in purgatory. So in the 1500s, the idea was that if you, um, depending on the type of life that you lead, you will go to purgatory and then be admitted into heaven. So if you um, do a couple of questionable things, you might spend some time in purgatory. The church, and remember it's the Catholic church or a universal church, um, Catholic means universal, is the only church available up until 1517. At this point, or in this area of the world, at this point, um, the Catholic church is soliciting funds in order to renovate St. Peter's, um, Peter's Basilica down in Rome. So the money is actually being used by the church for something that we're going to talk about later for these renovations. But Martin Luther has problems with, um, not that the money is going to the church, but that the church is saying, you may gain salvation through giving money to the, to the church. One of the other problems Martin Luther has with the Catholic church at this time is the intermediary of religious figures between the worshiper and salvation or the worshiper and the biblical text, the worshiper and um, pretty much God. So um, at this point, most, or at this point, the Bible is only in Latin and has not really been translated into the vernacular or the language that people speak every day. So that was another one of Martin Luther's complaints was that he wanted people to have a direct relationship with God. And he believed that images of Christ, the Virgin, saints, um, that those should have no place in a church. So that's why um, Protestant churches are decorated very, very differently than Catholic churches. So all of this happens um, in 1517. And we have um, kind of just this tumultuous time from 1517 until about the 1540s, 1550s, when we have everybody kind of starting to settle down and say like, okay, how do we react to this? What do we do now? And what happens is that those people who were protesting the Catholic Church become known as Protestants. So these Protestants that are wanting to reform the church are known as Protestant, and then it's the Protestant Reformation. But the Catholic Church has to respond to this. So they have the Council of Trent, um, as you can see here, 1545 to 1563, and that's the Counter-Reformation. So that is the Catholic Church's response to the Protestant Reformation in the North. And remember that a lot of the really big dominant European states at this time are Catholic, um, primarily think Spain, right? Spain is really in a height um, in the 1500s and Spain, we'll talk about a little bit later, has a lot of control. So the treaty uh, or the Peace of Augsburg in 1555 finally decides that religion of ru the ruler determines the religion of the area. And we see in England, this creates a whole upheaval that we can talk about at another time. But for us, it means that we really divide the Baroque into two different 
um, areas, the Italian Baroque that is going to be associated with the Counter-Reformation that we'll talk about today, and then the Northern Baroque primarily associated with Protestant Reformation, um, and we'll see that that's much more secular in nature most of the time than what we see in the South with the caveat that there are pockets of Catholicism still present in the North. Um, and again, that's because of Spain. So those tenets of the Counter-Reformation that trickle their way in, or that influence the Italian Baroque are that the Italian Baroque needs to be relatable. They say that art should appeal to the emotions it should be morally acceptable, and it should be easy to read. So they're not going to translate the Bible. Um, Martin Luther will do that. The Protestants will do that. But the Catholic Church is going to use art instead to be didactic. And this is something that's already been happening in the Americas, um, something that's kind of already being used by Spain. And we really see this influencing the Counter-Reformation, influencing the role of art in um, converting all peoples of the world to Catholicism. So the early 1500s are really kind of this powder keg and everything's kind of working together and producing this Baroque art of Italy. So this is a Baroque piece and I'm showing you it to you here with no um, information on it because I really just want to look at the formal or visual aspects of this artwork. And the first thing you might notice about this artwork is that it's very, very dark. The shading here, the shadows, are pitch black in some areas, specifically down here along the wall, kind of right above Christ's head. So the Baroque is about drama. The Baroque is about emotion. And we're seeing that filter into the visual qualities. We're seeing that happen in terms of the stark contrast of lights and darks. And we call that for the Baroque tenebrism. We also have this very um, poignant moment where Christ, so you can see Christ on the right, Christ has walked into this shady back room. You can imagine this is behind of a bar in an alleyway where these tax collectors are counting their funds. So you can see the other men really focused down on their funds and Christ walks in and he points to Levi, what's his name? Points to Levi and essentially says, you're coming with me. You're going to be an apostle. Levi then becomes known as Matthew. So he becomes St. Matthew. But what we see here is that these are not overly um, angelic individuals. They're not overly beautiful. These are really kind of common people. And Caravaggio is not trying to make them really beautiful. He's showing us that these are common everyday people so that then the viewer as a common everyday person can kind of imagine themselves in these figure shoes. So again, that relationship between the viewer and the art and trying to make the art appeal to the viewer. We can also follow this implied line from Christ's finger, right? And that hand should look very familiar if you um, watch the High Renaissance lecture. So we can follow this kind of implied line from this finger over to Matthew and notice that that is mimicked in this light coming from the window at the top. So we have a lot of movement. We have a lot of diagonals and diagonal movement, right? We're going left to right. And the other movement that we have in the Baroque comes into our space. So we have a figure here seated with their back to us. And his sword that he's wearing on his hip is really jutting out into the viewer's space. So this incorporation of the viewer, this incorporation of the viewer into the implied space of the picture plane is one of these characteristics of the Baroque as well. A couple of these other characteristics that we'll talk about a little bit later, such as being theatrical and having elaborate ornamentation, this dissolution of conventional space, a lot of these really also apply to sculpture and to architecture that we'll talk about in a minute. 
So this is Caravaggio, and Caravaggio is arguably one of the most famous Baroque artists, so much so that artists that come after him are called Caravaggistis, or followers of Caravaggio. And he is, um, he's a pretty unsavory figure. Um, he does a lot of illegal things. And um, he's kind of fun to learn about if you want to go down that rabbit hole. But for us, Caravaggio is important because of this relationship with the everyman and pulling in figures off of the street for him to paint. When we look at this artwork in its original context, um, which is where it still is, we see that the light in the painting is actually really incorporating the light coming in from this window. So the idea of Baroque art is that it's not existing in a vacuum, as we can think of other um, like Renaissance artworks. It's really existing in the space in which it, it, it has been created. So it's creating this full sensory experience, this um, integration of architecture and sculpture and painting is how we can think about the Baroque. And just to show you that difference between the Baroque on the left and the High Renaissance on the right, remember everything in the High Renaissance was very stoic, very kind of calm. And Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, who we're seeing here especially, was thinking about how do I show emotion through kind of the face and the movements. And what we're going to see in the Baroque is that now these movements are exaggerated and it's dramatic and it's theatrical. And all of that kind of comes through in these saturated colors, the tenebrism or that contrast of light and dark. And then um, these movements of these figures, right? This very specific pointing of Jesus and this very specific kind of hmm? of Matthew on the other side, right? Even though on the right, this is a tumultuous scene, we don't see as many of those big grand gestures as we do with the Baroque. So Artemisia Gentileschi is one of those painters who follows Caravaggio. So she paints in a style similar to him. Um, and Caravaggio's style is really synonymous with the Italian Baroque. Um, when you learn about Artemisia, she was taught by her father. Um, there were some really bad moments in her life, but we're going to ignore those in favor of just talking about her painting. Um, if you're more interested in her biography, there's a really great History Chicks podcast episode about her. She does choose narratives of heroic women frequently. And the story that we're seeing here comes from the book of Judith and talks about Judith right here, slaying Holofernes. So this is Old Testament. This is um, the Assyrians are invading Israel and she uses her womanly wiles to get into the Assyrian general's tent. So the Assyrian general being Holofernes. She gets him drunk, he passes out, and then she beheads him. So, you know, story as old as time. And as opposed to, I can show you, as opposed to the Renaissance versions of this artwork that chose that moment before something happens. Remember, that's one of our characteristics of the high Renaissance, is that they're picking the moment before something happens, that kind of pregnant, taut moment um, where you're anticipating something to happen. The Baroque is different. The Baroque is the moment that something is happening, right? It's the moment that she is beheading Holofernes, as opposed to the Renaissance version um, on your left, excuse me, which is the moment right before. So when we're looking at this painting, you can see the tenebrism. So you can see those stark contrasts of dark and light, but you can also see those diagonals, right? So there's the diagonals these implied lines of her arms, there are the implied lines of um, her maidservant holding him down. And then there's also this diagonal that kind of creates this V shape with um, Judith. So there's this diagonal as well of Holofernes' body. And then there's 
there's just blood, right? There's blood, there's gore. You get this sense um, really that Judith, her face is so determined, she's holding down Holofernes head. And then the same thing with her maidservant kind of pushing down with her arms. And then the arching and the foreshadowing of Holofernes body go receding back into space. One thing you might notice about these Baroque paintings in the 1600s is that there's no background, right? There's really very little setting to tell us what's happening. It's like there's just a spotlight coming in from this side. See that she's lit on this side of her face. There's a spotlight coming in and everything else is just black, pitch black. Um, Artemisia also, side note, is the first woman admitted into Florence's Academy of Design, so she was um, kind of a big deal in her day and continues to be. Okay, so if you've been following along with the lectures, you'll know that we talk a lot about David. So the story of David being David versus Goliath, um, this young shepherd boy who kills this giant with his slingshot. We had a version in the 1440s by Donatello, a version in the uh, 1500s by Michelangelo, and now we're in the 1600s and we're talking about Bernini. So this is early Renaissance. This is the moment after it's happened, kind of the aftermath of David and Goliath. Michelangelo is high Renaissance, so this is the pregnant taut moment before something happens. And Bernini is Baroque, so this is the moment something is happening. And this is what we mean by saying it's theatrical, it's expansive, right? Um, you get this kind of spiral twisting of David's body with the way that his legs are firmly planted in this kind of V shape, and then he twists his body around to the side. And this is a work that is meant to be viewed from all sides, right? With some of these other works, you get an idea that there's a pretty much um, an intended viewpoint, right? There's a singular viewer who stands right here and looks at this sculpture. If we were to look at David from the back, everybody'd be like, this is pointless, right? But with Bernini, you can walk around his sculptures and you get a different um, aspect. You get kind of a different view each time. And it's very intentional with that. So he um, is showing us this kind of split second, this apex, this climax of the movement, right? He's pulled all the way back. He's about to let it go and to hit Goliath. So we can kind of imagine that this is just one snippet of this film strip. Right. We would kind of view his body in motion. So we get this idea of time, we get this idea of movement, we get the way that he's taking up the space, we get that he is incorporating the viewer into um, the way that you're supposed to view this artwork. And then you can see at the bottom you have David straddling his lyre. So this is a um, stringed musical instrument. And that is referring to him as the later writer of the Psalms. But you also have his body armor down here um, acting as that plinth, acting as a nice stable support system for the sculpture. And that's because David in the Bible story says, no, no, I don't need armor. I have God to protect me. So he's, um, so this is still a religious work and we're going to continue to talk about religious works throughout um, this lecture. My favorite part of this sculpture is that concentration in David's face. The textures are fantastic. So you get the texture of the hair versus the texture of the skin. Um, but just that pursing of the mouth. We so frequently see art that is severe and stoic. And we're seeing the opposite here. We're seeing the drama. We're seeing the narrative. And he's pursing his lips. Um, he's eyes are kind of clenched, his brow is furrowed. All of this is concentration looking at his target. Um, another artwork that I wanted to show you by Bernini is his Apollo and Daphne because we can apply those same ideas that we talked about with his David to his Apollo and Daphne. But here I want you to go google this image and then zoom in 
because the textures here are fantastic. So Daphne is being turned into a tree and you can see down the bottom the texture of her leg versus the texture of the tree trunk versus the texture of her hair, the texture of her hair then turning into branches, turning into leaves. All of these are very different implied textures, right? So this is marble. It's all just marble. But the way that he, that Bernini manipulates the marble to create these textures is really my favorite thing about Bernini's sculptures. So Bernini starts his career um, writing plays and producing stage designs. So just as Caravaggio is really synonymous with Baroque painting, Bernini becomes pretty synonymous with Baroque sculpture. And he creates the drama and the theatricality and the movement of his works through his knowledge of theater design, through his knowledge of how the viewer is going to interact with the space. And that's really what he's doing here in our Cornaro Chapel. And remember, um, we're really focused on Rome in this lecture. You can see the painting at the top. These are stucco angels coming around. And then at the bottom, you have um, this kind of central scene, this ecstasy of St. Teresa that we'll talk about in a minute. But then you also have these um, kind of side areas. So these kind of um, shallow boxes. And these are donor portraits. So these are members of the Cornaro family who have commissioned this chapel, commissioned these artworks to go in this space. And they're kind of leaning over these shallow theater boxes in order to look at the main stage. So this is a theater. This is the way we're meant to understand these images. So coming into that main space, we can see that there's this emphasis on light, right? You have that gold shining down from the top onto our two primary figures. And when you go see this in person, you'll notice that there's actually a window right behind here that's hidden by this, um, this is called a broken pediment, right? So there's actually a window back there and some of that light is actually natural light. So again, thinking about the way that these artworks exist within their independent spaces. So not just, again, um, kind of this implied viewer. And this is zooming in on that central artwork and this is called the Ecstasy of St. Teresa. And she was a nun of the Carmelite order um, and she becomes a saint um, right about this time. So she's recently canonized. But what we're seeing here, of course, um, is the pun, pun intended, I guess, is the climax of her um, miracles. And this occurred um, shortly after her, the death of her father. She fell into a trance. She saw a vision. She heard voices. But more importantly, she felt persistent pain that felt like a fire-tipped fire arrow of divine love was being thrust repeatedly into her heart. All right, so hide the children if they're watching this. Um, this comes across this divine ecstasy, this delightful anguish, as it's been called, comes across as physical ecstasy and physical passion. Again, we're making Baroque art be relatable. And what is more relatable than sex? So um, you have really these moments of physical pleasure with, um, I always see it in her toes, right? Her toes are kind of curling. Her face is very limp. Her fingers have curled over the edges. And then you have this super creepy angel face staring down at her as he's, or they, angels do not have a sex, um, as they are getting ready to again plunge that arrow of divine love back into her heart repeatedly. I think you guys get the message. So in Ignatius Loyola's Spiritual Exercises, he says that the recreation of spiritual experiences and artworks would do more to increase devotion and piety. And that's what we're seeing here. The spiritual experience shown in an artwork 
based on the tenets of the Counter-Reformation that desire, desire to um, convert the world. So again, we're using this art to be didactic, but we're also using this art to be relatable. So at the beginning of this lecture, we talked a little bit about St. Peter's Basilica. So St. Peter's Basilica is in Rome. It is supposedly the spot where St. Peter was martyred. And the origins of St. Peter go all the way back to Constantine in the fourth century. We go from Constantine, we go to Bramante, we go to Michelangelo. So we have all of these renovations of this building. And then the one I'm going to talk about would actually be over here. So we have Moderno at the early 1600s. But I wanted to go back to our friend Bernini in the mid 1600s. So this facade that we're seeing, this is all Moderno. This colonnade is Bernini. So this has really become, um, again, symbolic, synonymous with Vatican. These welcoming arms of the Vatican that Bernini adds to um, the entranceway. So we had to work around the obelisk in the center. So that's an Egyptian obelisk taken from Egypt. He had to work around these pre-existing fountains. And then he had this, this idea of having this dramatic gesture of welcome, this dramatic embrace for all of these new converts coming to the Vatican, right? We're converting the world to Catholicism. And Bernini wants to incorporate that into his design. But again, it's dramatic. There is movement. It's not just two straight lines. So in that, it makes it very, um, very Baroque. The other thing that gives it lots of movement is that there are four rows of columns in this colonnade. You can see you have two on one side, two on the other side. So you really get kind of this forest of these columns as you're walking through this colonnade. The other um, artwork that Bernini designs for St. Peter's is actually on the inside. So we're going to look in here for a second. Um, you can see these are Bernini's welcoming arms at the front. And then to go back to the High Renaissance, you'll see the Sistine Chapel is right over here. So this is a baldacchino, or the baldacchino at this point. This is located directly under the dome of the crossing in St. Peter's Basilica. So when you're walking in St. Peter's, you have that central aisle that is called the nave. So you're walking down that. You'll get another aisle that will, um, is perpendicular to the aisle you're walking down. That's the transept. And the Baldacchino is located right where those two meet. So there's a dome there, and then this is underneath it. And first and foremost, you have to imagine this thing's hard to get a picture of because it's 100 feet tall, right? So 10 stories, 100 feet tall. This thing is huge. The other thing that's really hard to see because of the scale is so you have this really beautiful gilded bronze structure at the top. You have the cross with the orb of heaven below it. Um, so these are symbols of Christ's triumph. You have these figures on the sides and in the center. It's kind of overhanging tassels I'll get to in a minute. But then you have this thing, right? And this is the throne of St. Peter. So this is, so there's a little dove in there representing the Holy Spirit. All around that is orange. That's all stained glass. More gilded bronze kind of effusively coming out of that window, like spilling out of this Holy Spirit. And then below that is a throne surrounded by four figures. Got all that? <laughs> Underneath that is finally the high altar. So we had to get all the way down there. Um, I want to draw your attention to a couple of things. So those tassels at the top, what a baldacchino is, is it's a canopy-like structure. And the term comes from the word baldacchio, baldaccio, which is Italian for silk from Baghdad, which they use to make cloth canopies. So by the time we get to the Baroque, and we talked about this a little bit with the High Renaissance as well, the world is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. 
So you have all of these different influences, all of these different relationships happening all around the world. So you have the Baldekin at the top, and then you have what are called Solomonic columns. So these really great kind of twisty, ter um, twisty turny columns coming all the way down, giving again, movement and drama to this artwork. Um, our fun fact for this artwork is that they actually dismantled part of the Pantheon in Rome, um, so the Roman building, the Pantheon built under Hadrian, to use the bronze for this artwork. So that's the other thing. That bronze came from somewhere else, used in the Pantheon, gets used in the Vatican. So you do have um, artworks being used again and again and again. Um, lastly, I wanted to talk to you about Spain, because again, the world is getting very small. There's a lot of colonization during this time period. So we've really been talking about ooh, right over here, over in Rome. But Spain not only has Spain, it has portions of southern, um, southern Italy, it has portions of northern Europe. But more importantly, it has a ton of holdings in what we call today the Americas, right? We have our vice royalty of New Spain, our vice royalty of Peru. As time goes on, those get broken down into smaller vice royalties. But they also go all the way over, right? Our Manila Galleon goes all the way over to the Philippines, which is a Spanish holding. And they're there to trade with China. So you have objects, you have people, you have all of these things moving throughout the world. Granted, by about the 1660s, Spain has completely declined. The Spanish Habsburgs are done and over. But I wanted to show you that the Baroque doesn't just happen in Europe. The Baroque is one of the first styles that in the Americas we say, yes, we have the Baroque. It looks very different depending on where you are. So in um, Mesoamerica, we talk about the Baroque in different terms than we talk about it in Peru. And the Baroque is really late in the Americas, right? Everything has to kind of trickle over from Europe to the Americas. So it takes a little bit longer. But one great example of this exchange of ideas and how they influence the art is our cathedral in Mexico City. So this thing is just, it's a giant palimpsest. So first off, it's built over, I mean, all of Mexico City is built over Tenochtitlan, which is the capital of the Aztec, aka the Mexica is what they call themselves. Um, so this is actually built over their capital city, so the indigenous population capital city. This specifically was um, meant to be built over the largest temple in that city, uh, the Templo Mayor. And it was really um, not just symbolic, but very specific way of placing Catholicism over the indigenous religions, over the indigenous beliefs. They just kept building with this um, cathedral though. So they could just kind of keep adding on and adding on until we get to 1817 and the last little bit is added, which is that clock tower right there added in 1817. So we see elements of Gothic art. We see elements of Renaissance art. We see elements of Baroque art. We see elements of neoclassical art. And what we're really seeing is, like I said, this palimpsest, all of these different artworks, all of these different ideas manifesting in this building. And this building is the largest building in colonial America. We want to draw your attention to just one little aspect of this building. So kind of flipping it over, looking at the other part of the facade, and you can see those spiral columns again. So Solomonic columns go um, so they're a reference to King Solomon um, and his temple. They're a reference to Baroque art. And then they come to the Americas. And it's a reference directly to the Baroque art of Italy. So these Solomonic columns um, kind of have three references and three references to just keep going back and back and back. And I believe that is all I have for you today. So thank you very much. Have a great day.